Data in motion is complex, chaotic, and unsecure. Discover how the leading minds in the fields of technology, cybersecurity, and communications are tackling the challenge with new approaches and transformational technologies. This is the Secure Communications Podcast, brought to you by the curious minds at Attila Security, with your host, Kathleen Booth. Thank you for joining today's episode of the Secure Communications Podcast. I'm your host, Kathleen Booth, and today my guest is Michael Sutton, who is the founder of Stone Mill Ventures. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me, Kathleen. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Uh, before we dig into our topic today, can you share with my listeners a little bit about yourself, about Stone Mill Ventures, and your background and how you came to be doing what you're doing today? Yeah, for sure. So I've been in security pretty much my entire career. Uh, I spent the majority of my career in startups as an operator in uh, IT startups in the security space. Typically, I was the guy who would build the research teams. And uh, the last role that I had in that world was with Zscaler. I was one of the original employees at Zscaler, stayed there for a decade, ultimately became the CISO of the company. Um, and got into investing kind of later in that, uh, during that time, and just really fell in love with angel investing. I, um, I always loved building things, and that's why I was in the startup world. And then as I became an investor, I uh, loved the fact that I was doing that, but doing that with multiple companies and amazing founders who were pouring their all into these uh, great new startups. And I, I kind of decided that that was the uh, path that I wanted to go down. So. Uh, uh, the, when Zscaler went public, that opened the door for me to step down and do investing on a full-time basis. And so that's what I do now. I, I do full-time investing and pretty much exclusively focused on cybersecurity. Boy, as a side note, I can really relate to that because I owned uh, a business for 11 years. And when I decided to get out of that game, you know, I had a lot of different options and, and, with where I was in my career, I think a lot of my peers uh, tend to, to gravitate towards larger companies. And I just, as somebody who's owned a business, I love growing and building things. And so I, I too had that kind of affinity to startups. It's, it's a very particular world and it's not for everyone, but I think if you've got that entrepreneurial bone, it's, um, it's a pretty good way to, to address that need in your life. <laughs> Yeah, totally agree. And, and I always say being an investor is like being the uncle as opposed to the parent where I get to have all the fun and work with these founders and, and get to work on the ideas. But then when things get really tough, I, I can go over and help another one and hand the baby back to them. So, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. You get to that live in the awesome. entrepreneurial world, but uh, <laughs> less stress. I love that analogy. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you is that, you know, on this podcast, we, we look at all things relating to secure communications, which admittedly is a pretty uh, big umbrella. And mm -hmm. um, one of the, the topics that, that has come up again and again is this notion that at the end of the day, you can have an amazing security architecture, but your end user is, is still, in many cases, your, your greatest risk. And that has really led to the advent of this movement towards zero trust. Um, and I know you've, you've, you've got some thoughts on that. You've been looking into it. You deal with a lot of different companies that are playing in and around that space. And so I'd love to just start out by getting your thoughts on, on the advent of zero trust and, and why you think that that time is now for it. Yeah. So I think it's especially, uh, pertinent now, given that we're all working from home and, and we can dig into that deeper as we go. But, you know, working remotely and having technologies to do so is not new. We've been doing that for a few decades now. But historically, the way we would do that was using VPN technology, virtual private networking technology. Um, and now we're starting to see new technologies like SDP, software defined perimeter. Um, and we can get into kind of the differences between those. But the concept of zero trust um, encompasses a few things, but obviously being able to, the connectivity piece is, is core to that. And so you need a technology to be able to do that. Now, the, the term probably originated about a decade ago. I know Forrester, John Kindervog at, at Forrester was pushing this probably back in about 2010. And, and he's probably the guy who first, first coined that. Google has been talking about zero trust, although they, 
uh, typically talk about it under the moniker of their Beyond Corp initiative. Um, so they've kind of been doing internal business that way for a long time. And, and really, the, the philosophy is that we're, we're changing a paradigm on how we connect remotely. Whereas we used to have this philosophy of we just build an impenetrable fortress. You know, all of the assets are in the castle and we have, you know, the impenetrable moat around it. And uh, we decide if you should gain access. And once you gain access, you're good. Now, that worked when we were in a world where the corporation controlled all of the assets and they all sat in one place. Uh, but obviously, the world has changed dramatically. And, and that's not the case. You know, typically, um, I'm working remotely, I am on a personal device, I am using a cloud-based resource. So the enterprise no longer controls the device, they, they no longer control the network, they no longer control the data. So zero trust kind of shifts the focus from saying, hey, we'll make sure you're a good person and then we'll let you into the fortress and won't let you do anything, to changing that focus to uh, we're just not going to trust anybody. We don't care where you're sitting. You could literally be at your desk on the corporate laptop. I'm not going to treat you any differently than the sales guy who's sitting at the airport on his iPad. I'm just going to assume that everybody's untrusted and I'm going to authenticate you in real time specifically for that task that you're trying to complete. And once that's done, it's done. And then we'll worry about the next request when the next request comes. And so it's a very different philosophy on, on how we uh, handle remote connectivity. Yeah, it is interesting. And it's interesting to me because um, I think one of the guests I just spoke with in a previous episode, it, the, that episode was all about um, the human factor and why it's been so difficult to solve because that's not a new issue. You know, you have your your end users and you can build these amazing technologies to protect the corporate network. You can put in place great security solutions, but you still have people and their, their um, unpredictable behaviors and their, their uh, penchant to doing the things that are easiest and most comfortable for them, whether or not they make the most sense from a security standpoint. Um, and so it, it's interesting to have this conversation on the heels of that, because I feel like that is sort of where we've come to is that, even even with well-meaning end users, there are still behaviors that they will engage in that, it, with the best of intent, put the corporate network at risk. Um, sure. So so why what is the implication of zero trust? You know, not being solved. What do we stand to risk if if we can't put an architecture like that in place? Yeah, so, you know, the world is changing and so we have to adapt with it. And if we don't, it's really going to impact not only security, but our productivity. Like, if I say, you know, let's be really archaic and say, you can only work in the office and you can only work on the corporate issued uh, laptop or desktop. Well, right now your company would be shut down because <laughs> that is not an option. Uh, so that's a bit of an extreme example, but I think it illustrates where we're headed. and. I think it's also important to know, you know, often I'll get asked like, hey, what are zero trust technologies? Zero trust is not a thing. It's not a technology. It's really a philosophy. It's what we talked about earlier, where it's just changing the paradigm on how we do security, how we decide who is allowed to do what and when. Um, so, so it's really a combination. It, it, is, it is a collection of technologies, everything that is used to handle that authentication, do that connectivity, figure out the risks associated with it. So it's actually multiple technologies. Um, and and it, it, it's, it, it's a change in the philosophy and we're doing security at a separate layer. Um, whereas we used to do security at the network layer, what I was talking about before, like, hey, we'll decide if you need to get in and we'll give you that open pipe to do whatever you need. And now we're really doing security at an application layer where it's um, you know, we're doing it specifically for whatever task you are trying to achieve at that time. Uh, so again, zero trust, not, not a thing, you know, it's really an approach. It's a philosophy on how we do security and it just, it better fits where the workforce is headed and gives us much more flexibility and ultimately hopefully more security as well. Now, when you look at the landscape of organizations and, and organizations being a really broad term encompassing private enterprise, government, you know, nonprofits, educational institutions, you name it. When you look at the, the world of organizations and then you think about 
kind of the, the varying degrees of zero trust implementation from zero, I haven't done anything with it to 10, perfect world, I've got it completely on lockdown. Um, where are we right now? <laughs> sure. Well, I, I think we've just gotten a shot of adrenaline um, and that may be a silver lining of this pandemic that it's forcing us to kind of accelerate some of our thinking and how we do things. Uh, but, you know, where, where are different companies? Well, as I mentioned earlier, like Google was talking about this publicly back in 2010 where, and they weren't selling products related to it. They were talking about, hey, look, this is where we think the world is headed. And, and so we're internally building tools and technologies to allow us to do this. Uh, so they were certainly ahead of the curve. You know, I think I think on the other side, uh, more conservative organizations like like especially federal government, um, you know, uh, Intel organizations, things like that, they're moving more slowly, more cautiously toward that. And, and those that simply aren't able to put a lot of money into innovative technologies like not for profits, they might not be doing it as much. But you know, a couple things there. One it's it's not it's no longer a costly venture like as we move toward more saas based services cloud based services you know that that's one of the beauties of technologies like that you don't have to build and buy and maintain and set up an infrastructure you know you can literally rent that infrastructure so some of these cutting edge technologies are are accessible to everybody in a way that they they never were before and then back to my earlier comment that this fact that we've suddenly had to go from maybe a handful of remote employees to all remote employees it is really forcing companies to rethink things and say from a couple of perspectives. One, I think companies are, number one, they just have no choice. It's either shut the doors or figure out a way to uh, handle remote work and, and zero trust is a platform which enables them to get there. You know, two, I think when the dust settles, a lot of these companies and employees are going to revisit this and say, you know, this wasn't such a bad way to work. You know, companies are going to say, I didn't have to pay for office space. Employees are going to say, I didn't have to sit in a car and traffic for an hour every day. Um, so we were always moving in this direction. We were always moving toward cloud and SaaS and mobile devices and personal devices. And, and suddenly I, I see us getting the shot in the arm um, that's going to cause that trend to accelerate. Yeah, I'm already hearing those conversations. You know, it's really interesting, both both on the employee side of, I don't know if I can go back to, <laughs> to 40 hours a week commuting in, and also on the, the corporate side of companies saying, maybe we should renegotiate our leases, maybe we should downsize our space or get rid of our space. So that is interesting. Um, it's, it's, uh, I like that you mentioned cost, because my question kind of following on what you were talking about was going to be, what does zero trust do to to the cost of a security solution? And you said it doesn't increase it, but it's it's interesting to me why that is. Because on the surface, when you think about introducing that added layer of like check and balance at every new call it action that a, an end user will take, or every new entry point, or every new task, it seems like it would seem as though that's adding layers of bureaucracy and security solution, like architecture design. Is it just that these products are, are now being developed so that it's so baked into the system that it doesn't introduce a lot of inefficiency and additional cost? So let me, let me answer that from a big picture perspective. So I wouldn't suggest to someone that, hey, you can just throw out everything you're doing and move to a completely different security paradigm and it's not going to be costly. It will be costly because you're going to have to fundamentally change a lot of what you're doing. Now, if we go even a step above zero trust, uh, Gartner is now talking about SASE. That's sort of their, their new buzzword, stands for Secure Access uh, Service Edge. And, and really what they're talking about, zero trust is a component of that. What they're talking about is, hey, look, world is changing. And so let's combine everything that we need to do to get there. And they're combining the security and the networking technologies under one umbrella, which makes sense because it's pretty hard to separate the two at this point. Everything's interwoven. And they're saying, we're now delivering security and networking um, in cloud-based solutions, whether it's infrastructure as a service or SaaS-based solutions, things like that. And that encompasses a lot. You know, zero trust is, is one piece of it, but um, things like your, uh, your SD-WAN technologies, your CASB technologies, your uh, secure web gateways, all under that umbrella. So 
if you're going to do zero trust properly, um, it, it's not a small endeavor. It's not just, well, okay, um, you know, you used to, uh, you know, do things the old way and, and just give people network level access and then, and then now flip a switch and we're going to do zero trust. No, you're going to fundamentally change your network architecture, your security architecture and your security philosophy overall. So, so that is going to be a costly and lengthy journey and, and you're not going to just rip it out and start from scratch and do it overnight. It's probably going to take several years and, you know, as certain technologies, um, you know, come up for renewal, you're going to start replacing it. Now, if you're a greenfield company, it's very different, you know, like, I mean, if you started a brand new company tomorrow and you just started, you know, hiring people, let's say you're a small company, you're less than 20 people. I mean, that's just the way you would do it. You wouldn't set up an email server. You wouldn't set up file sharing. You wouldn't, you know, set up servers and, and God, install no. clients. <laughs> you, you would you would go and set up your G Suite and uh, sign up for some SaaS services and, and you would hit the ground running. So you would go down a zero trust path from the get go. Uh, so th th it, it sort of depends where you are as a company uh, based on, you know, how challenging, timely, costly uh, this movement will be. So have you seen any companies right now that you think are kind of the, the standard bearers for how this should be implemented? I mean, you mentioned Google. I'm assuming that they've, they've got to be drinking their own champagne. I, I like that phrase better than yeah. eating their own dog food. <laughs> sure. um, but other than Google, are there any out there in the wild that, you, that come to mind that you think are really leading the pack with this? Sure. Like going to my statement about how if you were starting a company now, prior to my time as an investor, I, I was at Zscaler for a decade. And, and we really drank the Kool-Aid, the Zero Trust Kool-Aid, for good reason. We were That was a big part of our business that we were selling. But that was really core to our philosophy. Like we were very adamant that we were going to do everything in a SaaS-based model. You know, everything was going to be single sign-on. We weren't going to run servers. I still remember a conversation, you know, as a CISO, I was focused on security technologies and I was uh, looking at this technology from a uh, well-known but I'll keep unnamed vendor and they said oh you just have to install this component on one of your internal servers I said I can't so what, what do you mean like it's you know it's just this little virtual thing you just saw I, th I said I don't have any servers and he looked at me like I was nuts you know at the time we had 2,000 employees so we weren't a small company but that was core to our philosophy and although we were you know kind of bigger than most companies that um, would have been as as um, you know diehard on the whole zero trust philosophy, um, that was the reality. And and I think that any company start, starting today will follow that same path. Um, so yeah, I, I think technology companies, especially any technology company that started within the last half dozen years, that's that's just a given that you're going to go down that path. And you know, obviously, with this kind of a shift, you're you're moving from um, taking ownership of your security at the local level to really, I guess, for lack of a better term, outsourcing that to, you know, the cloud providers. Um, how confident can companies be that their cloud providers have this all on lockdown? Sure. And, you know, that's a question I'd say I get asked less now because we're more comfortable with it, but I used to get hammered with well <laughs> said this is security i can't outsource security um and to me it's not that that's not really a decision at factory so i think the vast majority of companies would see far greater uh security when they move to cloud providers uh because that is their their key focus so now you mentioned before that zero trust is not a technology and i think you made mm -hmm. a great point about that it's it's a philosophy it's a culture within the organization Having said that, <laughs> are there some technologies that you're or, or providers that you're particularly excited about with regard to you know them doing really cutting edge work that's going to feed into the ability to solve for zero trust? Yeah, yeah. So I think you know again, zero trust kind of has all these components. It's got uh, an authentication component, an identity and access management component, a security component. Uh, but I think a key part of it is uh, for those remote uh, employees is the connectivity piece and that's where 
we're, we're seeing a shift in the way that uh, external entities will connect to a system. Whereas historically, we'd re, we would use VPN technologies. Uh, now we're moving to something called SDP, Software Defined Perimeter. And really to, to kind of just summarize the differences between the two, VPN is a network, networking technology. So the idea is I would connect somebody at one time, um, authenticate them, make sure that, hey, this is a trusted person, trusted device. But once they're in, they're in. And then they can do whatever they need to on that network, access whatever resource. Right. Keys to the kingdom, right? <laughs> Keys to the kingdom. Now, it's not wide open. Like, like I would use access controls within the environment, but that's sort of a separate thing. Like I have to do a good job on that if I make a mistake. And, um, you know, some of the big data breaches in the past have resulted from that. The really famous one is Target, where uh, a, an HVAC vendor had a network connection, a VPN connection, and obviously wasn't locked down. I mean, all they were supposed to do is check the HVAC systems, and, but the attacker was ultimately able to leverage that to get to the point of sale systems. So software defined perimeter, which is a uh, zero trust technology, takes a very different approach whereby it's not network level access, it's application level access. Um, I'm not getting a connection at the beginning of the day and then keeping it open, I'm connecting as I need it. So I'm in an application, it needs to access a file that could be anywhere. And that's an important part of it. It's really transparent to the end user. It could be in the uh, private data center of the company. It could be sitting in AWS, it could be on internet resource. It doesn't really matter to me. I just know I need to get it. So it would establish that connection at that time for that purpose, authenticate me and once I'm done, I'm done. Now, it doesn't mean I have to type in my password every time I change a cell in an Excel spreadsheet. That's transparent to me because other technologies like single sign-on are taking care of that. But that's kind of the core difference in the philosophy between a, a networking level technology like VPN or an application level uh, connectivity technology like SDP or software defined perimeter. Great. Um, and, and any companies out there doing coming coming to market with really interesting products to solve that? Yeah, so there's a lot of players in the SDP space, Zscaler, that was a big part of, of our business. I, a lot of the you know, networking VPN companies are, have pivoted, like they, they recognize you know, the checkpoints of the world, the pulse secures. Um, I'm also seeing a number of startups, um, like in the past year, I've had some companies pitch to me like Meta Networks and New Edge, um, both of which have actually already been acquired. And that's not entirely surprising to me, A, because it's a, an increasingly hot space, but also because you need to, you need agents on all the devices. And it's increasingly hard to convince the CISO to install agents on thousands of devices. So um, the incumbents have a leg up because they already have that real estate taken care of. So a lot of them are leveraging those same agents to now offer SDP capabilities. So a lot of it is kind of the usual suspects in the networking space, the VPN space that are now offering this as functionality or acquiring SDP startups to get there. Great. All right, shifting gears, I have a couple of questions I, I typically ask my guests and I'm curious to hear um, what you think. I guess the first one being, you know, with the way that we communicate and manage data changing so quickly, what do you see as the biggest challenge that we're going to face with respect to securing communications in the next few years? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you two answers to that. One very immediate term and one longer term. You know, the immediate term, as we were discussing, uh, you know, we're, we've been forced into this sudden change of everybody working remotely. Well, at some point, we're going to have to go back. I, I think the new normal will not look like the old normal for a lot of different reasons, some of which we discussed. But from a security perspective, it's going to be tough to roll that back. You know, we companies quickly threw the policies and the rules out the window because, you know, we just had to stay functional. So, you know, it might have been like, hey, you could only work two days a week or, hey, you can't access that server unless you're in the office. And suddenly that got chucked out the window and it was like, everybody gets everything. Well, what happens when we go back to work and, and that has to get reeled back in? And like, as a guy who's worked in security most of my life, I know um, drawing a line in the sand and holding it is one thing. Um, coming into a new company and saying, okay, all the stuff that you used to have, all this flexibility and access that you used to love, it's going away. 
that's really hard to do. So I think, um, you know, uh, uh, recalling these rights is going to be an immediate challenge. Uh, but I think longer term challenge, I, security talent is really the biggest challenge that we're going to face. You know, there is a major shortage of security talent. Um, and that's one reason why as an investor, I'm very interested in companies that, that can help um, you know, make things easy for companies to do security. Not, I don't need expertise. I don't have to build this uh, massive, expensive, and heavily staffed security operations center. So that, that's always going to be a challenge that we're going to face. So what new security technology are you most excited about in the next five years or so? <laughs> yeah, so I spend a lot of time looking at um, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, technologies in that, you know, it's a fascinating space. And unfortunately, much of what you hear is hype. Uh, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, I'm, I'll be the first person to tell you that AI and ML is not a silver bullet to solve uh, all of your problems. Um, but, you know, there's no doubt that that's where we're headed. Now, anytime I get a pitch where it will, number one, I don't think I could possibly get a pitch where the person doesn't mention AI and ML. Like, it's just, they, they, it's kind of, uh, you know, bel the belief is like, you're expected to have that and, and you are. How but, often do they really have it though? Because I've noticed people over, they abuse those terms and, and use them liberally when they're not really accurately describing the product they're talking about. Totally. I, I'd say nine times out of 10, <laughs> as I start digging and pulling on the thread, really, once you get under the covers, it's the same old stuff, signature based yeah. uh, technologies and things like that. But again, there, there's no doubt we're moving in that direction. So if I get a pitch where it's like, hey, we use AI and ML, to create this black box that's magic and just put the data in and all your answers will come out the other side, that's going to be a short pitch meeting because that's just not true. That's not the way it is. But uh, we are already at a stage where, where AI and ML um, can do narrow tasks quite well. Like I'll give you an example. What we're not good at doing is just there's unstructured data and it's, hey, go find bad stuff in there. It, that's just too complicated. Uh, but if it's more specific than that, like um, hey, in this pool of data, can you tell me what was a human being and what was a machine? It's actually pretty good at that because machines behave in a very predictable manner. You know, they only go to a couple of domains and they only, and they do it at the same time of day. So it depends on what, um, you know, what problem you're trying to solve, but, you know, absolutely a fascinating and, and critical technology that is going to take uh, time to live up to its full promise, but th there's no doubt in my mind that it will be driving every security solution that we have in the future. So third question, company or individual, who do you think is doing really interesting and cutting edge work in the field of secure communications right now? Uh, good question. So like, I think, you know, some of the, I think it's it's too easy to just say, hey, we're going to throw out the old with the new. So let, let me give two answers to that. Um, one, you know, it's important that we still are enabling and empowering uh, existing companies that aren't able to move to some of these technologies that we've been talking about. Because, you know, I'm still going to have, for example, uh, I might have legacy devices that I can't go install some STP agent on. They still need a way to get in there. I'm going to have situations where I don't have control over that endpoint. Like maybe I'm not dealing with an employee. I'm dealing with a, a contractor or a consultant and they're simply not going to allow me to install something in there. So I still need a way to be able to continue on uh, with some of these technologies like VPN technologies. So Attila, who uh, I'm on the board of, you know, they're really answering that challenge by having, you know, taking that technology and making it accessible in a way that it wasn't before in very small hardware based devices that are very secure. And so they're able to answer some of those challenges for companies that, you know, have situations where they're not going to simply be able to just move to an entirely new paradigm. Um, and then on, on the SDP side, um, Zscaler, I think, is really the market leader there that they've really pioneered a lot of this. Um, and 
made it so that it's very accessible and very easy to deploy. And, and you know, I think they've, they've won a lot of people over um, who have seen that, hey, you know, this is where we're headed in the future. Um, and, you know, now with this workforce that is just a completely different workforce that is remote and mobile, um, this is a, a new paradigm that we need to move toward. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think it's going to be hard to uh, put the cat, bat in the, <laughs> the cat back in the bag at this point. Um, well, thank you for joining me this week, Michael. This was really interesting, and I loved hearing your thoughts about Zero Trust and, and where it's going. Um, if you are listening and you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving the podcast a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you choose to listen. We do want to hear from you. And if you have an idea for a future episode or you think there's somebody we should interview, tweet us at Attila Security. In the meantime, thank you, Michael. It was great chatting with you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Secure Communications Podcast. Visit AttilaSec.com and subscribe to the podcast to hear more stories and insights from the bold thinkers at the bleeding edge of communication security.